Writing that sitcom, A How-To Guide, with occasional pep talks and interventions by James Carey, read by James Carey. Pre-titles. They never liked David Frost. The cool kids, like Peter Cook and Willie Rushton, thought he was a try-hard. In a sense, they were right. David Frost tried hard, and wasn't afraid to be seen to try. And he really succeeded, fronting the legendary That Was The Week That Was and The Frost Report, as well as chat shows in America and Australia. He interviewed Nixon, launched a successful breakfast television show and received a knighthood. Sir David Frost was some kind of genius. He tried and succeeded. For Cook and Rushton, genius should at least appear effortless. For Peter Cook, it probably was. He had one of the greatest comic brains in the history of the English language. Comedy seemed to come so naturally to him that it wasn't even fun. We Brits love the idea of the effortless genius. We love the Peter Cooks of this world. See also Peter Sellers, Eric Morecambe and even Oscar Wilde. We love their wit, their inventiveness and their charm. And we laugh at the tryhards. We never truly respect the David Frosts, despite their enormous achievements. In fact, sitcoms are full of hapless tryhards who never get the respect they crave despite their best efforts. Why start a book about comedy talking about Frost, Cook and Rushton? because it's easy to fall into three traps when thinking about writing comedy. Trap 1. The mistake of thinking great comedy is the work of unalloyed natural genius. There are comedy greats like Peter Cook who seem to have an instinct that the rest of us can only dream about, but it's extremely rare. And much of it is myth. Look into the history and you'll discover that geniuses of sitcom often cut their teeth writing episodes of kids shows or sitcoms that really weren't that great or didn't last. I'm not claiming to be a genius, but I did write some episodes of Chucklevision, as did Russell T. Davis. They say, you've either got it or you haven't. Like all sayings, there's an element of truth to it. There's no point pursuing comedy writing if you have no aptitude for it whatsoever. You need to have some instincts for comedy. But they are only the starting point. Instinct is important, as is perseverance. And these two things will carry through as you learn the craft. Trap 2. The mistake of thinking comedy is something anyone can do. There's an increasing competition mentality seeping into the industry. Well-meaning institutions like the BBC, in their attempt to find new comedy voices, give the impression that anyone with a good idea for a show will be able to turn in a smoking hot script without too much effort. It just takes a laptop, some strong coffee and a long weekend, and then if they're lucky, they're sorted for life. They're a writer. The problem with writing is that it seems easy. Typing is easy, but writing is not. Being a writer is not like a real job, where you have to study hard, sit exams and get qualifications. There are quite a few jobs you can't just rock up and do. You can't use your natural flair for open heart surgery and get a job cutting people open in a hospital. You need years at medical school and you have to pass exams and you can't just use your skills of rhetoric to simply be a barrister. These things take time. Writing sitcoms is the same. It takes time to get good at it. You don't just need any accreditation or specialised equipment. But as we will see in the book, writing a script, especially a pilot script, takes months, even for those who've been working in the industry professionally, for decades. Every now and then a genius comes along who seems to have knocked out a brilliant script in an afternoon, but that's not you, or me. This book assumes that you are not Peter Cook. If you are Peter Cook and your brain is just wired funny, throw this book away at once. Burn it, delete it, destroy it. Without reading the content, I look forward to seeing your TV show and buying the box set. But the odds are that you're not a natural. If you're not someone special like Sir David Frost, you'll just have to put the work in. Here's one more dangerous idea floating about the place. Trap 3. The mistake of thinking great comedy follows a secret formula. There is no shortage of people and conferences willing to take large amounts of your money to let you in on the secrets of being a screenwriter. They implicitly, or explicitly, suggest that they have access to some hidden blueprint for all successful sitcoms, movies and novels. They do not. Because there are no such things. The only secret is what hard work it is. These gurus and seminars all have their place, I would say that. I'm writing that kind of book. But to claim there's one way, or a right way, to write a sitcom is crazy. All I'm seeking to do is explain what I've found works and what tends not to. This book doesn't contain immutable laws of comedy. I only offer guidelines and nothing more. A music Sven Gali may think he has a secret formula for a hip pop song. They tend to be frothy, hooky and under three minutes. But then a band like Procul Harum comes along and smashes all those rules. So why claim their rules? 
One of the most famous phrases in modern screenwriting is William Goldman's Nobody Knows Anything. This seems to be the only rule. Recently I picked up John Truby's 22 Steps to Becoming a Master Storyteller. Hubristic title aside, I found parts of it quite useful. But Truby is often dogmatic and sometimes disparaging of other techniques. He even calls out Aristotle for being overly simplistic in his poetics. Ballsy. And he seems to think that the perfect film is Tootsie. Whereas the perfect film is actually Nuns on the Run. I have disproportionate love for that movie. My point is, the secrets of story and comedy are elusive and will always remain so. We all have our theories, but there are always exceptions that seem to defy all logic and reason. There are plenty of comedies that should work, but don't, and plenty more that shouldn't work, but do. Attempts to boil down all comedy to six jokes or seven stories or whatever are, in my view, a waste of time. There do seem to be useful rules of thumb in TV situation comedy, but you may find out that breaking all of them will mean that you are hailed as a god of comedy or find yourself receiving two pages of vitriol from A.A. Gill in the Sunday Times. Been there. Or both. You may learn things which work once and then never again. Or something that works every time and you can't figure out why. Either way, there's a lot of pain, misery and poverty along the way. A lot. And you'll put up with it because you want to be a writer. Or do you? Before we really get going, let's have this out. <laughs>